Hello, I'm Okar Rizvi, and this is Scope. Now, as we know, the G7 summit, as of this recording, is still ongoing. It will run till the 13th of June, that is Sunday, um, three days of, as these G7 leaders meet. They're going to be discussing, and they have been discussing, uh, some of the main issues the world faces uh, beyond just, of course, their collective concerns about Russia and China. There's also concerns about vaccine and the pandemic and how it has affected the global economy and their effort as some of the most powerful economies in the world to restart and to give a push to the global economy through a vaccine donations around the world. So we've heard uh, exorbitant numbers, a billion vaccines, I believe it is at this point that these countries will will donate around the world. But even that many activists and campaigners are saying is not enough to in fact get the world economy churning and to have enough people around the world vaccinated to be able to achieve that. And then there are other big key issues also on on the the agenda, um, such as climate change as well, uh, global taxes on corporations, uh, something which has been in the works for quite a while now. And of course, as we know, the corporations have fought against. And, uh, you know, the elephant in the room, I would think for Boris Johnson especially, will always be Brexit as well. And we may be able to touch on that a little bit in this conversation as well. Let's discuss all of the above for, above a bit further. We're not joined by Dr. Christopher Ankerson, who is a clinical associate professor of global affairs at the Center for Global Affairs of the School of Professional Studies at NYU, that's New York University. He's joining us this morning from New York. Joining us from Clearwater, Florida, is Dr. Blair Arcrifti, who is an Associate Professor of Political Science at St. Petersburg College. Blair and Christopher, thank you both for joining us this morning. Uh, Christopher, let me start with you, if I may. Um, let's firstly discuss, if we can, um, the pandemic and how these G7 countries fared during the pandemic. Uh, how would you assess their performance and how would you assess their decision vis-a-vis -vis the vaccine donation? around the world. Well, thank you very much. And clearly, as you mentioned, front of everyone's mind, regardless of where you are in the world, including the most powerful economies in the world, is the impact of COVID-19. I think the, regardless of the power and, and the size of some of these economies, the, the, the record on how they've dealt with it has been relatively mixed, I would say. Uh, countries like Italy and, and Canada have uh, suffered in, in mobilizing appropriately in getting their populations vaccinated, not only vaccinated, but even, uh, you know, properly quarantined in, in many cases. Countries like the United States struggled in the beginning, but since the uh, Biden administration has come into office, have managed to ramp up their ability to, to vaccinate the, their their population. Likewise, with the United Kingdom, they they had a rough start at the beginning, uh, but now have done fairly well in terms of the rollout. I think what's interesting, though, is probably the impact that this has had on the trust and uh, in government amongst their populations. Almost all of the G7 countries now are facing a, a deficit in people's ability to perhaps feel that they can rely on their governments to provide these kinds of essential services. Uh, despite a lot of talk about readiness and, and resilience, uh, none of the countries in the G7 have done particularly well in, in, in uh, reacting to this in a way that is going to engender uh, trust for whatever comes next. So there's a lot on the line for the G7 countries now with, to hopefully draw a line uh, under their, their poor performance and you know be able to see be, be able to be seen by their populations as mm. you know getting the, the the next phase of this of this going we, we look at countries like Japan for example very much yeah. pinning their hopes on the Olympics for example but it's uh, it's not going well for mm. for, for for Japan so uh, I think they would really like to kind of get this all behind them the Indeed. the vaccine donations are clearly important uh, however I, I would agree with uh, the, the the comment you made earlier about uh, what activists are saying, it is it is rather sad that this has taken so long. Um, I think most yeah. of the, the the advanced industrialized economies have been selfish in their approach to vaccines. They've they've made sure that they've taken care of themselves first, and now are are making promises about getting this out to to other people. Mm -hmm. Probably only in the in the realization that um, if they don't, then they're not going to have the ability to have the entire globe back up and running. So this is, I think. Uh, mm -hmm relatively late and and the, mm. the the circumstances in in many places around the world including for example india uh are are a testament to uh, you know how bad this is outside yeah. of the bubble of the g7 itself
Indeed. Blood Christopher there made a really good point there what, about vaccines, and I want to get your thoughts on that, because there's one thing to talk about, yes, the trust deficit for the citizens of these G7 countries, and that, of course, I want to get your thoughts on as well. But for the rest of us on the outside of these G7 countries, there's also a trust deficit and just a, you know, a, bit, of, a bit of confusion about the, the way that many of these countries have acted in an extremely selfish fashion, not realizing from day one, as doctors and physicians were saying and WHO was saying, we're all in this together and so vaccine uh, patents have been an issue as you know that's been debated um, you know where do you think that these countries stand in that regard are these donations enough to cover up for all that well in my opinion I think that we have I don't think that we have a lack of resources here lack in this case of vaccines I think that the 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 entire you know international system is in a state of uh, how can I say that this disorganization because what is lacking here I think is the ability to come together and to kind of uh, uh, distribute the vaccines to the countries that they need, that, ne that need vaccines. And this is what is lacking, I think, in my opinion. That's where I think, in my opinion, the United Nations would have been a better actor and institution to kind of make this possible for countries that have vaccines, because in the US, we are giving prizes, trying to convince people to get the vaccine. Uh, while, you know, at the same time, we see people in, you know, states like India and other countries that desperately need vaccines and are willing to get them as soon as possible. But, you know, we are not able to kind of give them vaccines to those countries. So I think that we are lacking organization in this case. I think that the, the most important thing that we should do is for a solid institution like the United Nations to kind of uh, bring these countries together to make it possible to distribute you know, vaccines to the you know, states that need them the most. Uh, and it, with regards to this, you know, the matter of trust, well, it, I don't think that it is going to change. There is always this lack of trust, you know, between you know actors of the international system. I don't expect you know any change, you know, to occur in the near future. But you know, here we need some kind of some more organization. So the key word here, and I keep repeating this, is organization. We have the vaccines, and all they need to do is just to have a proper proper. Yeah process to send those vaccines to the countries that they need. I think that they all okay. know that they have enough of what is, you know, of vaccines, but they yeah. don't know how to provide them, how to give mm. them. So I think that they are in a state of chaos, in my opinion. Mm. So they okay. don't know how to do that. They want to yeah. do that, but they don't know how to do that because yeah. you have, you know, a mixture of Indeed. interest as well, economic interest, but still they want to do it. But, you know, mm. it's a matter of organization, in my opinion. Well, that mention of econ economic interest, we're quickly running out of time, so I'm just going to give both of you final comments. And I wanted to, before letting you go, talk about uh, this, these taxes, these global taxes um, that, these, that these G7 countries have, have agreed upon, all these multinational corporations around the world that they'll be taxed more heavily. Um, I, I've been reading about this and I've understood that they, they will still be unevenly distributed, but nevertheless, it's been seen as a step forward because this has been in the works for a very long time, Christopher. What are your thoughts on that? I mean, I think it's an interesting uh, attempt to to uh, address issues of inequality, which, again, have contributed to this idea of mistrust. Uh, countries ha are aware that their populations are not happy, that multinational corporations like Amazon have made out very well during the pandemic. This has been, in some senses, the, the kind of perfect storm for, for e-commerce sites, for example. Amazon deliveries, the, the personal wealth of the of the owner of Amazon, for example, has has just multiplied during, during the pandemic. So this is an attempt, I think, to to try and be seen as uh, addressing those those gross inequalities. But I think it's it's a it's a very marginal step. Um, the you know the the devil will be in the details. The lawyers on all sides, I'm sure, are already out there looking for the loopholes, looking for the leverage that they need to be able to go to a country and say. Um, I, I need an exception or I'm going to conduct my business in a different way so as to to exploit this. Um, I'm not sure that it's going to make very much of a difference to that kind of trust deficit that we talked about. Certainly, um, there will be countries that will be looking to exploit loopholes, whether that 
uh, whether those countries are in the G7 or not, to be able to to hopefully you know find some some upside to this that maybe mm. they can be seen as a new a new bolt hole for these countries to to move their profits to. Um, we've talked about internationally schemes like this before and they've not yeah. come to fruition we've talked about car, a global carbon tax for example on on international air travel as a means of generating income to to hopefully offset some of the inequality from the from the rich world to the to the more developing world uh, and so far we've not seen that it would be great if that were the case but i'm skeptical that this is actually going to have much of an impact very well. And final word to you, Blitter, on the same point about taxes. There is always a worry, right, about then discouraging investment in these respective G7 countries? Well, first of all, I totally agree with uh, Dr. Ankerson. And I would like to add that uh, they, this is a great opportunity. The G7 summit is a great opportunity for countries, for you know, democratic countries to come together to have some photo ops, to kind of talk about some very important issues, including in this case, the corporate taxes, global you know, corporate tax. However, I think that the G7 as an informal institution is outdated, is an obsolete informal institution. It may talk about the, all these kind of issues, including you know, corporate taxes. However, I don't think that it is the right institution to address or to solve these issues with regards to corporate you know, taxes. Still, it is not clear. It is not clear because the minimum that they are proposing is 15 percent, but in America it is already 21 percent and loopholes in this case, as Professor Ankerson mentioned, you know, individual states are going to find loopholes to kind of avoid, you know, the is, you know, tax requirements. But I think, again, the, I believe that G7 is not the right institution to address these issues. It's good that they are talking about this, the COVID-19 vaccines, the corporate, yeah. you know, global corporate tax. However, I don't think that that's the right institution to basically solve those issues. It is an outdated institution, obsolete, in my opinion. And that's a very good point to end on. And we really, really appreciate Christopher and Bladar for taking their time out this Saturday morning to discuss uh, the G7 summit. Just a few of the issues that we were able to get to, of course, were uh, A, about the vaccines themselves, A, performance of these G7 countries during the pandemic to begin with, and then this vaccine distribution, vaccine patents. That's been a huge controversy and debate for quite a while now throughout this pandemic. And we are now just have a donation of a billion vaccines, which, as we've discussed, is simply not enough to really get the world economy to churning as these countries want. And then there's the huge issue of these global taxes and these taxes on corporations, these corporate taxes, however you want to term it. And, um, you know, what exactly is this message that's being sent? And the fact that, you know, a report after report now is showing that this is actually going to be distributed unevenly, these taxes, and that that may very well then destroy the whole goal of what's being sought to be achieved here uh, at this time. I'll be back with my next segment after this break. Welcome back, viewers. You're still here in Scope with me, Okar Vizvi. Now, in this segment, we're going to discuss Iranian warships, which have headed out from the ports of Bandar Abbas. And where exactly they're headed is not known at this time. There's much speculation uh, on the part of the U.S. media that these ships may be bound for Venezuela. One of these warships uh, is... Um, an intelligence gathering vessel and another is a domestically built destroyer. Uh, even the Iranian Navy's own officials have said this is the Navy's longest and most challenging voyage yet. And now there is, as I said, already freak out on the part of the U.S. establishment about what exactly these warships may be carrying. Are they carrying arms for the likes of Venezuela or otherwise? Um, the U.S. has already warned Venezuela and Cuba to reject these Iranian ships and many are pointing out then to, to the U.S. that, listen, um, these are so sovereign countries. So if they do wish to have these warships come into their territory, that is their sovereign decision to make, A. Eh? Um, and then, of course, there are other related issues to, to U.S.-Iran relations, as we well know. Um, there are those continuing Vienna negotiations. The U.S. has lifted sanctions on a number of officials, even though it says that these are not connected to the Vienna negotiations, former officials, that is, I should, I should clarify. And then on top of that, we have the Russians as well, uh, selling or giving, in fact, um, that spy satellite technology to the Iranians to then be able to spy um, on, you know, 
uh, Israeli targets, one would imagine, or Israeli and U.S. bases, in fact, across the Middle East region, um, areas which, of course, would be of sensitivity for the Americans and the Israelis, one can only imagine. Uh, let's discuss all of the above a bit further. We're now joined by Dr. Stephen Zunas, who is a professor of politics at the University of San Francisco. He's joining us from Santa Cruz, California this morning. Joining us from Arlington, Virginia, is Yusuf Azizi, who is a research analyst in U.S. foreign policy decision-making and is a Ph.D. candidate in public administration at Virginia Tech. Yusuf and Stephen, good morning to you both, and thank you both for joining us. Uh, Yusuf, let me start with you. Um, is there legitimate reasons to be concerned about why these warships have left Iran and where exactly they're headed and what exactly they may be carrying? Uh, not particularly, because, uh, you know, in recent years, uh, the Iranian and Venezuela has uh, um, um, produced a uh, strong relationship, uh, according because of the United States uh, uni unilateral sanction against these two countries, even Cuba and other countries like Russia and China. So Iranian tried to send, uh, you know, some tankers of uh, gas and gasoline and oil to Venezuela to restore their economy, even... Uh, you know, doing some business on, uh, you know, food market in Venezuela. So uh, they now try to uh, secure this uh, relationship, this uh, movement uh, by their ship to the Venezuela from Persian Gulf to the Atlantic coast. So uh, they try to secure this with some uh, vessels, uh, so uh, with their navies. And, you know, Macron is not just an intelligent thing. It, it is, uh, it is um, you know, converted uh, tanker, oil tanker to, you know, become supporter of the vessels with food, gasoline, and, uh, you know, uh, security to other uh, small vessels. So uh, this, this, is, this is just the routine um, exercising of the international law and uh, the law of the sea. There is nothing very um, that, that the United States are concerned about sending two vessels to the Atlantic House. It's not something that concerns the United States heavy army uh, present in the region. So then, Stephen, if we're completely honest, is this less about these warships, but just the fact that these two countries, as Yusuf there said, who are both under sanctions by the U.S., the fact that they're supporting each other in some way out of the reach of the Americans, that that in and of itself has, has bothered the establishment? Exactly. I mean, the, the idea that two Iranian warships are sailing uh, uh, sailing into the Atlantic Ocean and possibly, uh, may, maybe, maybe not, uh, going on to the Caribbean is somehow a threat to the United States is just so ludicrous. I mean, the United States uh, you know, has scores of warships uh, sailing right off the Iranian coast along the Persian Gulf. We've done that for decades over the years, uh, going back to the uh, tanker war in the 1980s. The United States has has uh, Bombed uh, coastal facilities. Our, our our navy navy jets, navy boats have, have attacked, killed a fair, fair number of Iranians over the years. Even shot down an Iranian airliner back in 1988. I mean, there is um, uh, given the the history of the massive military presence uh, right along uh, Iran's uh, coast. The fact that we would some people would suddenly start getting all upset about two Iranian warships in the Atlantic Ocean is is really just ludicrous beyond words. This is a political thing. This is has nothing to do with uh, uh, America's uh, uh, legitimate security interests. So then, in that context, then Yusuf, um, considering um, the freakout about this specific incident, a in mind, but then b, do you think it's important then that this news about the Russians giving this this satellite technology, possibly spy satellite technology, to the Iranians is relevant? Because uh, this just goes to show, I would imagine, on the part of the Iranians that they are a reaching out to all of their friends, be it the Russians, Chinese, or even others uh, beyond them, um, for this sort of technology to keep themselves uh, secure. So, you know, uh, in October 2020, last year, uh, the, the United Nations arm embargoes on Iran expired, okay, uh, despite the United States' objection uh, the, uh, under uh, President Trump administration. So, you know, uh, Iranian, after, um, after seeing what happened under JCPOA, okay, they didn't get the benefit they 
assume from JCP from the Western countries, they, they now reach to other major powers in the world, China, the strategic relationship with China in, 20, in the next 25 years. So they now ask some, uh, you know, military equipment or intelligence uh, activity by Russians. So this is, this is, this is part of Iranian uh, making balance of power in the Middle East, in the ongoing um, you know, disputes in the Middle East, that Turkeys, Qataris, Saudis, Israelis, everyone want to uh, get a hand in this region because of United States uh, assume that leave the region, at least, you know, uh, decrease the presence in the region because they want to focus more on the East Asia. Uh, so, so this is not uh, the, the getting them, you know, uh, some kind of um, intelligence um, support from Russia is not something that uh, directly um, um, dispute the United States interest in United States coastal or something like that. It's just focusing on the Middle East. But Iranian now sees that they have free hand to get more support from other major powers to, uh, you know, to, to make some pressure on the United States to restore JCPOA maybe and, uh, you know, restore the, the, the relationship that Iranian sees after, uh, sought after the JCPOA signed in 2015 from Western countries. Stephen, I'll give you the final word before I let you both go. Um, on that point of the JCPOA and what's happening right now in Vienna vis-a-vis -vis the negotiations, we do have this news, as, as you well know, that a number of former officials of Iran, the sanctions that were had been placed on them in the past have now been lifted. The Americans saying this is an administrative decision, that there's no connection between these two moves. That may very well be true, and I wanted to get your thoughts on that, A. But then B, also upon this, this, this move of the Iranians to reach out to the Russians and or vice versa to get this sort of spy satellite technology. I mean, it sort of seems almost like mixed messages from both sides, isn't it? Yes, I, I, there, I mean, Iran is, is looking at many options that they have before us. I mean, the, the um, uh, it's the United States, of course, that withdrew you know, from the uh, agreement in the first place. And it's been, uh, they've sort of been divided by a common goal, you might say, in trying to uh, um, uh, reach some kind of agreement. And, and uh, Iran is tired of its isolation and tired of its enforced isolation. They're tired of the double standards the United States and some Western powers have had regarding its nuclear program compared to those of neighboring countries that actually have nuclear weapons. And so I, I think there, this is, um, uh, they're basically, basically hedging their bets, you might say, to try to, uh, to, to end their isolation through this. I, I, don't, I, don't think, I don't think we should overread it, however. I mean, I think that uh, uh, whatever happens in the nuclear accords, Iran is going to continue to assert itself as a mid-level power, uh, certainly as a regional power, and uh, as, 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 as reasonable as criticisms of the Iranian re uh, uh, regime are. And there are many legitimate criticisms of, of Iran, as there are of Russia and Venezuela and other countries. I, I think that uh, uh, the United States is, is, has, has to uh, recognize that it is a more pluralistic world, and we can't uh, control every country. We can't control their military maneuvers. We can't control their alliances. And I think uh, we need to, uh, uh, to, the United States needs to uh, be uh, uh, well, asserting its interests, like any country, it needs to uh, stop being so, so arrogant if you, uh, and, and, and not uh, I think we can somehow uh, control the world. That's a very good point to end on. Uh, we'll leave there at that, but we really appreciate Stephen and Yusuf for taking their time at this morning, speaking to us from California and Virginia, respectively, sharing their expertise with us. So we were discussing there the warships that Iran has sent out to the Atlantic, um, you know, just a um, complete freak out on the part of the U.S. media and establishment about what those ships may very well be carrying, as Stephen, they're contextualized for us. These are just two warships, if we're completely honest, versus the many, many that the Americans have very close to the Iranian um, coast and shoreline. Um, Iran is very well within its international power and laws, of course, as Yusuf, they're set to send out these warships. It's not doing anything against international law at this point, even if it is helping allied countries like Venezuela. Then there's a spy satellite technology. Is it a game changer? We don't know at this point, but it is important for the Iranians to reach out to its allies to find ways to, uh, quote unquote, secure itself. And then there are these Vienna negotiations that continue. Um, as Stephen there said right at the end, this all seems to be, um, if we're completely honest, about America trying to control at all times everybody around the world, which I would imagine is quite a tiring task anyhow, and probably it should give up on that and just accept the fact that it is living now in a multipolar world. I'll be back with my final segment after this break.
Welcome back, viewers. You're still here on Scope with me, Okar Vizvi. Now, in the final segment of today's show, we're going to discuss a statement that was made by U.S. Congresswoman Ilhan Omar. As you know, she is the congresswoman for uh, Minnesota, I believe it is. Um, and she made a statement essentially about accountability and justice when it comes to issues regarding any crimes, war crimes, that is, that may have been committed in Afghanistan and or the occupied Palestinian territories. And she essentially um, called for across the board a just and fair approach where all parties involved uh, would be then objectively, um, you know, studied properly and investigated and their respective crimes would then be held to account. Now, obviously, for many of us on the outside of the United States, it doesn't sound like very earth shattering material that she said. But for those within the U.S. Congress uh, and even those within her own Democrat Party, a lot of this was something that was unfathomable, seemingly. And um, there has been an uproar and outcry ever since she made those statements. So she made two statements. Statements. She made one statement to Secretary Blinken, who is the U.S. Secretary of State, while he was in Congress at a hearing. Uh, she asked him about the fact that the U.S. does not support any ICC investigations. And she said, what other recourse really is there for accountability then if the U.S. doesn't allow for such investigations? And B, then she tweeted as well about this topic. And both of the above then, as I said, contributed to that uproar. Uh, Rashida Tlaib, then another congresswoman, has come out and defended her, as have other people, saying that, you know, why can't she have a dissenting voice? Um, is that because she's a Muslim congresswoman that she's asking for something different, essentially, in the U.S. Congress, that that in and of itself is to be seen as, as uh, a negative necessarily in this case. Let's discuss uh, those issues a bit further. We're now joined by Shahid Amanullah, who is a former senior advisor of the U.S. Department of State. He's joining us this morning from Washington, D.C. Also joining us from D.C. is Dr. Sarah Hamis, who is a professor of communication at the University of Maryland. Sarah and Shahid, good morning to you both, and thank you both for joining us. Uh, Shahid, let me start with you. As I said, you know, and I, and I read Ilhan Omar's statement a, in, in Congress to Blinken, and that really seemed quite uh, vague in the sense that she didn't really even refer to specific parties. It was quite a general statement, but she, yes, referred to Afghanistan and Palestine. But her tweet, yes, was a lot more specific. But I mean, does any of the above really uh, call for this sort of uproar and quote unquote controversy? If you look at the statements by themselves, I agree with you. They're, they're fairly kind of factual, and uh, they don't really rise to this level of response. But you have to understand that the landscape underneath this has changed. It's changed in multiple ways. First of all, we are no longer under a president that enables Israel's right wing to do whatever it wants, um, and, and people are still trying to get used to that. The second is that the American landscape is no longer looking at the situation um, in the same way that they've done in the past. Uh, the, there's been a very natural alliance, I think, with, for example, people in Sheikh Jarrah, the whole thing that, start, that started all this. Um, I think the American landscape has been kind of uh, shaped by Black Lives Matter, and people are much more sensitive to human rights violations. Um, so what you're seeing here is kind of a last ditch effort to try to stop what really should be a natural conversation. I think the one the thing that I find really interesting about this is that no, she mentioned the U.S., Israel, Hamas, Taliban, all these different parties that have engaged in human rights violations at one time or another. And I find it really interesting that nobody's actually uh, angry with her about putting the U.S. in that list. And I think part of that is because. Yes, all of these parties have done human rights violations. It doesn't mean that they can't be redeemed. It doesn't mean that they can't fix it. But, but the very specific mention of Israel in that, in that list is, has given people uh, something to react to. And, and it's kind of a last hand, actually. Yeah, or, you know, um, uh, to have even your own party then come out um, and, and, you know, essentially censure you, as Pelosi did and as other Democrats attempted to do as well. I mean, I, and I know, I know that the squad, as they're referred to, have always been outliers, even within the Democrat Party. But um, what are your thoughts on that? Uh, thank you for having me on the show. Let me just start by saying it's not the first time that this has actually happened. Uh, back in uh, 2019, uh, Ilhan Omar, of course, she is, as we all know, the first black Muslim, uh, you know, congresswoman. Uh, she actually also had a similar incident back in 2019, also because of a tweet, right? So she also sent a tweet in 2019 that was critical of the pro-Israel lobby, when she actually said in her tweet, uh, it's all about the Benjamins, baby. And she was actually referring in this tweet to the fact that there are some American, you know, politicians who do receive some kind of money or support, financial support from the pro-Israel lobby. And she was referring specifically to APAC. 
the American Israeli Public Affairs Committee, which is of course known for its really uh, strong support for Israel all the way along. So really what happened was she also received strong criticism from the Speaker of the House, Nancy Pelosi, and also members of her own Democratic Party at the time for the very same reason. And at that time, she was actually called, quote unquote, anti-Semitic. The criticism of Israel is oftentimes perceived as, quote unquote, anti-Semitic or anti-Semitism, which is, of course, a very dangerous, slippery slope because it can curb freedom of expression or freedom of speech for those who have some critical views of okay. the policies of the Israeli government. Government, even though they are not anti-Semites. At that time, uh, Ilhan Omar had to come out and she had to, quote-unquote, uh, you know, push back or really kind of uh, speak back against the whole situation and say, you know, I did not mean to be anti-Semitic. Uh, I'm now being educated about the whole situation. And then she issued after that an apology for this particular tweet. Now, fast forward to the year 2021, we are faced with a similar situation, again, involving Ilhan Omar and again involving Twitter and involving the Speaker of the House, Nancy Pelosi, and members of the Democratic Party. This time also because of the tweet that Ilhan Omar sent that she said there are are unspeakable atrocities which are committed by hmm. the U.S., Israel, uh, Taliban, Hamas, and Afghanistan. And she also had a video exchange with uh, the Secretary of State, Antony Blinken, asking him about, uh, yeah. you know, what is going to be done? What is the accountability in terms of these particular crimes hmm. and in terms of making sure that we can secure the rights of the victims of Indeed. these types of human rights violations and these types of crimes? And how can they possibly get some kind of, you know, um, acknowledgement or some kind of rights given to them and yeah. what is the role of the uh, international crimes committee in this particular situation again right. in this particular case she also got criticism from speaker of the house nancy pelosi and a dozen of jewish hmm. uh, democratic uh, members of the house of representatives and she said well instead of issuing a statement and uh, accusing me or trying hmm. to uh, criticize me why didn't you just speak to me as a colleague and try to have some kind of conversation with me directly. If, if I can come in, you've made some really interesting points there. And I wanted to add, if you allow me, Arsalan Iftikhar to the conversation who is joining us now. He's also joining us from Washington, D.C. He's a human rights lawyer and also author of the new book, Fear of a New Muslim Planet, Global Islamophobia in the New World Order. Arsalan, we really appreciate your time this, this Saturday morning. Um, I wanted to get your thoughts, Arsalan, about something that Sahar there just said, right? It's, it's essentially, um, seemingly, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but this seems like the growing pains of a changing U.S. establishment in Congress, right, where we know that there are more people of color that are probably going to be coming in and representing their respective constituents who are also more people of color who have then dissenting views on what we have heard so far when it comes to even specifically the issue of Israel-Palestine. Uh, is this just representative of that, that essentially the likes of Pelosi and others are having a hard time letting go of that very concrete view that has stayed for so long? No, Akar, I, I think what, what the, the case here is that we have really never seen um, such bad faith interpretation uh, of any member of Congress's uh, statements uh, than Ilhan Omar in recent history. Uh, and, and that's that's the key here, is that there is literally nothing uh, that comes out of Ilhan's mouth that is not um, perceived with a negative bias by Republicans, uh, that is not, uh, you know, uh, misinterpreted in the most negative way possible. And then, uh, you know, to, to have the Democratic Party throw her and the squad under the bus uh, is something that is very problematic because we see a lot of, uh, you know, racist and xenophobic statements coming out of uh, congressional Republicans virtually on a daily basis with not even a slap on the wrist. Uh, from their own party, let alone any sort of meaningful opposition from the Democrats. And so, you know, when 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 the Democratic Party is willing to throw their uh, own members under the bus, uh, you know, just by you know the perceived slight of the Republicans, you know, in the famous uh, words of Mae West, with friends like these, who needs enemies? Yeah, that's a good point that Arsalan there, you know, mentioned, right? And this is something that Rashida Tlaib essentially also pointed out to, and she obviously spoke about this in, in very, very strong words, saying that, you know, that this is essentially the fact that because it is Ilhan Omar as a woman who wears a headscarf and is visibly a Muslim woman and is a woman of color, that she is t being targeted for this statement in this fashion. What are your thoughts on that? Look, it's, it's just very clear that Ilhan and also Rashida and other people are being held to a different standard. Um, let's take let's do a little thought experiment. If we took Ilhan Omar's statement of 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 make of that that all 
uh, countries and organizations should be held to an equal standard when it comes to human rights. If she had simply not mentioned the names of the entities, you'd have universal agreement. The only thing that triggered people was the fact that she actually mentioned the entities. And that should tell you something. That should tell you that these people are not concerned about the base, uh, the base statement that she's trying to make, which again, everyone agrees with. It's simply that she actually mentioned entities in that statement and that they, they should be held accountable, including the United States. And again, nobody's complaining that she mentioned the United States in that statement. So it seems really, really odd that the, the introduction of, of one other player, Israel, in that statement was enough to cause this. But it just, it just shows you that the landscape has changed so dramatically, so quickly, that people are scrambling to react to it. Mm. Let's tackle that directly then, Sahar. Um, Israel then. There, you know, what recently happened across the occupied Palestinian terrors, we, territories, we even saw within the U.S. those in fairly high positions, even in Hollywood and otherwise, did in fact speak out about what was going on and not necessarily along the lines of what usually has come out of the U.S. during such times. Um, does that mean that there is a shift occurring and that that does then make the establishment worried? There is indeed a shift. We have to acknowledge that very clearly. There is now a shift in public opinion. There is much more awareness of what is going on inside occupied Palestinian territories. There are demonstrations. Thousands of protesters went out to demonstrate more than 35,000 in the last demonstration, which was pro-Palestinian rights here in Washington, D.C. Thousands went out and demonstrated in many different cities across the United States. And inside the American Congress, Congress itself, we are also seeing a shift in policies to towards the uh, Middle East uh, uh, foreign affairs and specifically the Palestinian-Israeli conflict. We saw clearly the shift and also the division, which is now really revealing itself very clearly in the Ilhan Omar case between the so-called progressive Democrats like Ilhan Omar, like Rashida Tlaib. Of course, they are the first uh, Muslim uh, American, you know, congresswomen. And also there are uh, progressive, uh, you know, uh, senators, for example, like John Ossoff, who is Jewish, uh, like Bernie Sanders, who is Jewish who are speaking up and saying, hey, the United States cannot continue to give, uh, you know, uh, almost $4 billion a year in military aid to Israel without having Israel have some kind of accountability and have a better human rights uh, record. We cannot give $735 million in new arms sales to Israel without having Israel accountable and yeah. have some kind of much better record, especially in its treatment of Palestinians. And then we have the more, you know, let's say the centrist or the more, uh, quote unquote conservative camp inside the Democratic Party, represented in Speaker of the House Nancy Pelosi and others like those who issued the statement criticizing Ilhan Omar, whether back in 2019 for some of her tweets or again in 2021, also because of some of her tweets, who represent a camp that does not change the policy of quote unquote the, uh, you know, let's say unconditional support that the US has been giving to Israel over the years. So, what this whole controversy, in my opinion, reveals is this kind of deep division and also this kind of shift in U.S. position and U.S. foreign policy uh, towards Israel. Let me just comment very quickly on something sure, that very, he just very said quickly right if now. you can, yes. Yeah, yeah, very yeah, quickly, yeah, yeah. The, yeah. the tweets that actually Ilhan Omar uh, sent uh, recently, the one that was creating all of this controversy in 2021, was actually criticized for, quote-unquote, uh, comparing uh, mm. some kind of comparison between, quote-unquote, so-called democracies like the U.S. and Israel and so-called, quote-unquote, terrorist organizations like Hamas and Taliban and putting them all in the same basket or in the same group by including them in the same tweet. So that was the yeah. reason why her particular tweet came under attack. And of course, this is all raising all sorts of issues, especially that the U.S. itself has negotiated and sat at the same table with Taliban in negotiations for peace in Afghanistan. Okay, sorry, I'm going to come on. Arsalan, I wanted to give you the final word before letting all three of you go. Uh, on the issue then of what this represents then, and I don't want to overstate this, but I mean, what does this represent for Muslim Americans going forward vis-a-vis -vis their place within foreign policy making in their own country, right? As citizens of the country, um, does this mean that they are finding their place uh, as much as it is making um, everybody else uncomfortable or many uncomfortable? I won't say everybody else. Yeah, well, God, I, I'll be honest. I, I don't think that a lot has changed uh, in terms of... Um, in terms of foreign policy, you know, you know, people have been going to rallies for 20 years. Rallies don't change anything when it comes to the realities on the ground. What we're seeing here is 
that you know you have a a Muslim woman member of Congress who is like who is a quadruple minority in America, right? She is a black female Muslim refugee, uh, right? And and so for many people, this this sort of quadruple minority aspect of things allows. Uh, you know, many people on both the right and in the Democratic Party to to attack her with impunity and without any sort of meaningful pushback. And, you know, like I said, at the end of the day, the, you know, the Republicans say racist things on virtually a daily basis without any sort of meaningful, um, you know, condemnations. Whereas, you know, a, a Democrat can say something that is, you know, in, in a childish way, you know, spun in the most negative way, and even their own party throws them under the bus. And so, you know, you know, the reason that I, I, I wrote, you know, uh, my new book on fear of a Muslim planet uh, is the fact that people don't trust Muslims. And, and, and you know, we, we still have a long way to go in, in terms of combating uh, not only conservative Islamophobia, but liberal Islamophobia as well. Yes, I do think that there has been some uh, shift uh, you know, in the the recent um, uh, back and forth between Israel and Palestine, in terms of sort of the American discourse, but we have a long way to go. When you know, one of our two uh, female Muslim members of Congress, uh, you know, is, is essentially silenced by her own party for the most bad faith attack uh, that I've seen in a long time. Very well. We'll leave it there at that. But we really appreciate all three of our guests for for taking their time out this Saturday morning to share their expertise with us. That was Arsalan, who was speaking to us from D.C., as well as Sahar and Shahid, who were also speaking to us from the U.S. Capitol. Uh, we were discussing there the controversy, quote unquote, uh, that has erupted because of Ilhan Omar calling for across the board accountability and justice uh, in places like Afghanistan and the occupied Palestinian territories regarding any war crimes that may have been committed there. She began um, this uh, speaking to Secretary Blinken, the U.S. Secretary of State, at um, a hearing in Congress where she essentially asked what if the U.S. was not then willing to support the ICC investigations, what then was it willing to support so that there would be a proper fair justice and accountability in such regards? And then, of course, she went on to tweet, as we discussed in this conversation as well. Um, it, did this require the sort of controversy? Is this essentially, as I put to our guests and our salon especially, growing pains regarding how Muslims are finding their place within um, American politics? Of course, that is up for debate, and I don't want to overstate the situation. But as Shahid there mentioned uh, a number of times, this only came about because she specifically mentioned Israel, and that in and of itself should be disturbing for everybody who is watching this at this time. I'll leave it there for that. I'll be Mukhar Rizvi. Thanks very much for watching.